So, last night, I was uh, driving to the church late last night. I saw a car accident, and this car had, uh, right here on Ferguson, had jumped a curb and hit a pole, and there was smoke coming up from the car. There were people gathered around this young Hispanic girl on the ground, and she was <gasps> just struggling for a breath of air. I thought she was dead. I didn't know. So, so I pull over into the parking lot, and I go into charismatic mode and start praying like a radical charismatic crying out for mercy, thinking this woman is about to die and she's choking. She's on her back and she can't get air and she's choking on her saliva or whatever was in there. And I said, turn her over, turn her over. Like, cause she couldn't breathe. She was, she was trying to grasping for air and they, they turned her over and, and, and then the, the paramedics got there and, uh, and there, it was, And it was right across the street from this biker bar, like the Bandito's biker bar. So there was this rough group of guys and just a rough group, mixed group of folks right there. And I'm thinking, man, what am I doing here? These guys look kind of, they might jack me and take my car here. Or they might get upset that I'm trying to pray for this woman out loud. But I think the the boyfriend who I think had been drinking didn't seem to mind at all because he was in a, a place of desperation as well hoping that she would make it through that. And, uh, and the reason I share that this morning is because life is precious. And the breath that you and I breathe every day, every moment, is precious. And we take it for granted. We take it for granted. God graciously gives us breath and he gives us life. And let me tell you something. The oxygen that God is letting you breathe right now is like the Holy Spirit who lives inside you as a Christian. You see, God gives us life by his spirit. He he raises, we were dead in our sin and he made us alive and now we get the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And some of us maybe take it for granted, maybe don't even think about the reality that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he lives inside of you and he gives life to your mortal being. And I believe that this morning he wants to move in our hearts. He wants to breathe upon our lives And he wants to do a deep work through his word this morning. And so we're going to talk about this new life in the spirit. This new life that's marked by the Holy Spirit. The Christian life is marked by the Holy Spirit. D.L. Moody said this, you might as well try to hear without ears or breathe without lungs as to try to live a Christian life without the spirit of God in your heart. I'm going to say it again. You might as well try to hear without ears or breathe without lungs as to try to live the Christian life without the Spirit of God in your heart. It makes me wonder in many churches how many people are trying to, to live a Christian life, a good life. Maybe don't, they don't even know Jesus yet. They don't even have the Holy Spirit yet. But they're trying to be good and moral and a good religious person. Theo Moody says it's like trying to breathe without lungs. It's trying, it's like trying to hear without ears. The Holy Spirit is our helper. And in the book of Romans, he is the, Romans 8, he's the dominant character in, in Romans chapter 8. He's mentioned, uh, about 19 times in Romans chapter 8. And so Paul in Romans chapter 8, this is arguably the greatest chapter in the Bible. Some would argue that. It is a very great chapter of the Bible. And it describes the Christian life. Okay, it describes the Christian life. What it's like to be a Christian. Now, I would also argue too, and and before we we get into Romans 8, that, you know, there's Romans 7. Also, I believe some theologians would disagree, but some would say there was Paul as a Christian in his struggle as a Christian with sin. Uh, That 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 was also the Christian life that that while we are free and have freedom from sin's dominion as Christians, that there's there's still a struggle. There's still a war to wage 
on sin. Last week we talked about Romans chapter 6 and we talked about our new life in Christ and how we died with Christ. We died to sin and we're alive to God and we're to consider that to be so. Okay, that's sanctification and all that is that sanctification is built on the reality of justification that we've experienced. We've been declared righteous by faith and we build upon that foundation. And I encouraged us not to mix those two up or justification and our sanctification. And, and, and then and then Paul goes into uh, Romans chapter seven, this this relationship between the Christian and the law and, and, and his struggle with sin. And, and he says these words, he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And as I say those words, some of us here can relate and identify like, yeah, wretched man or woman that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And Thank you, Jesus doesn't end there because he says, thanks be to God that through our Lord Jesus Christ, he delivers us. He delivers us. And so I quote that just starting off because there's a therefore at the beginning of Romans chapter 8. Go ahead and stand with me if you would. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for our sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are not debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So here's where we're going this morning from Romans chapter 8. The Christian life is marked by the presence and the work of the Holy Spirit who brings freedom, who brings life. And who brings peace. The Christian life is marked by the presence and the work of the Holy Spirit who brings freedom, who brings life, and who brings peace. Now I want to I wanna have some balance here in this. Because this, this is true. I believe this is true. Whether that's my experience or your experience or not. But I would be willing to bet that it's every Christian, 100%, every Christian, after you became saved, genuinely a Christian, and the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you, you still had, you have still had some kind of struggle with sin. If you say, no, not me, bro. You don't know my testimony. I'll be like, you're a liar, man. You are li- I don't believe you. Actually, I'm going to ask your wife and see if she agrees with you. I'm going to ask your children and see if they agree with you that you don't have any sin struggles, right? And so the reality is, is that though we've been set free, though we're new creations, though we don't have to live under the domain of sin, we still have this ongoing battle, this ongoing war. 
that we have to fight. And I think we'll have that until the day that we see Jesus' face. And we are removed forever from the presence of sin. Anybody look for that, look, long for that day and look forward to that day? When we don't have to be around a bunch of sinners. Mean, loud sinners, including ourselves. Oh, wretched man that I am, right? We get to be where there's perfect righteousness. We get to dwell in a world where there's perfect love and there's no joy killers. There's no, there's no peace robbers. No more. Satan is out of there. No more to mess around with us and to, to accuse us and condemn us and, and, and try to bring us down. And so I want to have sympathy, though in my life, God has, by his grace, given me glorious freedom in Christ Jesus. Amen. Glorious freedom. I don't want to give the impression to anybody here that I'm perfect or that I think I am or that I'm like above, like I'm, I'm the, 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 one of the higher rank Christians. I'm special forces, <laughs> Christianity, because I'm free in Jesus, right? I still identify from time to time with what Paul says here. In chapter 7, verse 15, for I do not understand my own actions. For I do, for, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. I can relate to that. Can you? I can relate to that. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Let's just blame it on sin. It's the sin that made me do it. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but do not, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want to do, which I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Yeah. Yeah, I can relate to that. So let's not let sin reign in us, right? So I find it to be a law that when I, when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. I delight in the law of God and in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God in my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. And so again, I I think this was Paul as a Christian. Other theologians would disagree and say, well, no, he was talking about before he was a Christian. And there's some, there's some, you got to do some, some, you got to camp out in Romans 6, 7, and 8 if you're going to digest it. Okay, there's some meat there. To just take in, you know, you don't just, it's not like a smoothie, it's just going to go down smooth. I mean, you need to chew on this, okay? Chew on this meat, this gospel truth and meat and let it, let it become digested into your being so that you can thrive spiritually and grow as a Christian and be mature as a Christian. And so there's this struggle, but there's this victory, and I tell you, I am so grieved when I see my brothers and sisters, when I'm counseling or just listening or just, just trying to encourage a brother and sister who just seems to live in Romans 7 for too long. And I think in my mind, bro, you just need to get over to Romans 8. You just need to get to the end of Romans 7. There's more. You don't have to stay stuck. Oh, I do what I don't want to do. Oh, sin dwells in me. Confess it. Acknowledge it. Kill it. Don't let it live in you. Don't let it have power over you. Quit focusing on it. Oh, this sin. Oh, I can't fight. I can't beat it. Now, I, I'm, I'm very strong here and I want to be sympathetic as well because there may be some struggles right now that, that brothers and sisters here are having and it's hard. And I don't want to just tell you just, just quit it. Just stop doing it because I know that sanctification is a process. It's not like justification where, you know, you're just once, once, 
Once upon a time, we believed and were declared right. Yeah, that doesn't change. But sanctification is this ongoing process. It's this struggle. We take a couple steps forward, and then, oh, we took a step back again. Take some more steps forward. Oh, I fell again. Oh. All right? And it should be like that. There should be this progressing. If you're a Christian, you should be progressing and becoming more and more like Jesus by the Spirit of God working in your heart and your life, by the grace of God that you stand in. You're being sanctified in as well. Because where sin abounded, grace does abound much more. And so I, I'm grieved when I hear brothers and sisters talk about their sin struggle and they just pun it to, man, I'm just going to be like that until Jesus comes back. And they just surrender to a lie that they're just going to have to live the rest of their life as this angry person or this addicted person to some substance or this person who uh, can't just stop lusting after people and images. You don't have to live in that. There's freedom. There's freedom. And you can't get that freedom and and walk in that freedom by your own human ability, by your own willpower, by your own mental strength, by your own uh, uh, whatever disciplines and boundaries. I'm going to set up all these boundaries up so I won't ever look at that again. Well, then you start thinking about it. Yeah, you don't have the images in front of you, but you're thinking about it. The sin's in there. You need it out. And there's only one person I know that can deliver you and I from our sin. And his name is Jesus. Amen. And may we never forget the bondage that he has delivered us from. May we never forget that f- those feelings of despair, discouragement, of condemnation, of shame, of guilt, of unworthiness, because we're such great sinners. This is John Newton, the, the writer of Amazing Grace, who he was a former slave trader. And he said, I know two things, that I am a great sinner, but I have a great Savior. Amen. Do you know those truths? Does, does that resonate with you? Yeah, I'm a great sinner. I'm like, if Paul's the chief of sinners, I'm like uh, next under. Like, right? Do you, you feel like that? I'm a great sinner, but Christ is a greater Savior. His grace is greater. His grace is greater. The cross was enough to bring about a decisive blow to sin in your life and my life. There is a victory that we have in Christ Jesus that we fight from. We don't merely fight for victory over sin as Christians. We fight from a place of victory. Jesus has finished the work. He's broken the power and he's provided freedom for you and I to walk in. He has taken our condemnation. We have no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1. I don't know about you, but just this truth here makes my heart want to explode. No condemnation? I deserve to be condemned to hell. I deserve to be condemned death penalty. The wages of sin is death. And the gospel says, no, you don't have to die. Jesus has stepped in. He's taken our place. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. He's taken our place. And he has won the victory for you and for me. And so there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When you're a Christian, you're in Christ Jesus. God takes you out of being in the old Adam or being in um, the domain of darkness. And he transfers you into a new kingdom, a new reality, new management, as I said last week. All right. Anybody go to a restaurant that needs some new management this week? <laughs> Or maybe a restaurant that had some new management and you're thankful that they do because it's good now, right? We are thankful that we are now under the new management of Jesus Amen. and of grace and of the Spirit. He's cleaning house. Right. He's changing us. He's transforming us from the inside out, from the mind and the heart to our words, our thoughts, our actions, our attitudes. He's changing us. Don't give up. 
Don't surrender. Fight from this place of victory. Know that in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. He's taken that for you and me. This is foundational. As I said last week, to, to know that we're justified, to know that the penalty for our sin has been paid. Don't try to pay for it yourself or pay God back for it. I'm just going to be really good this week and try to pay Jesus back by loving people really well. <laughs> Give my stuff away. I'm going to church on Wednesday. I'm going to community group. I'm going to the evangelism thing. I'm going to write some thank you cards to people. I'm going to tell my wife how much. Don't try to pay Jesus back because you can't. He paid a debt that you and I could not pay. And that condemnation is removed. Now, I think this should lead to not feeling condemned. While I don't think he's primarily talking about the feeling of being condemned, I think he's talking about the legal, there's legal language there of, of the this legal status that we have. No condemnation. That should, that should free us up from living under the feelings of condemnation and shame and guilt. Because now we're declared righteous. So this is foundational. If you, if you want to, to get victory over sin in your life, then you've got to fight from this foundation. If there's no condemnation in Christ, you are in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, uh, we have freedom from the bondage of sin for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. I love this. For, for what the law has done, weakened by the flesh, could not do. God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. The wrath of God was laid upon Jesus for you and me and he took our place. He condemned sin. Jesus became our sacrifice for our sin in our place. So there's no condemnation for us. And now we're free from sin's bondage. We can walk in that freedom, live in that freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, freedom liberty. We sang it this morning. Do you feel free this morning? Yes. Do you feel free? God, well, God wants to just, just take off the grave clothes. Take off the peels, the crusty peels like an onion. Just peel it back. Take off the chains, just layer upon layer. He wants to remove those things from your life, from glory to glory. Shape you in the image of Jesus so you're free to be who he's called you to be and do what he's called you to do. Man, that feels so good to, to not be in bondage to the approval of man. The fear of man. What do people think about me? Do they love me? Do they accept me? Am I cool enough? Who cares about that? We're in Christ Jesus. He's enough. We're accepted in the beloved. So we're free. You know, this, this can maybe seem like an abstract thing, but I think this should be a reality in our lives. And, and one of the ways I, I can think of to try to describe it is the law of gravity being like the law of sin and death. Let's, let's try this. Law of gravity, right? Okay. And then the law of aerodynamics being like the law of the spirit of life, Christ Jesus. I don't know exactly how all that works, but I know that when I get on an airplane and they start it and they take off, we go up into the air and we're flying and I'm just enjoying the beauty of God's creation. And then sometimes we hit some bumps and I start praying a little bit more. <laughs> Lord, give a wisdom. I'm in your hands, God, right? But something happens there. There's this law of aerodynamics. Praise God for the Wright brothers, you know, and discovering this reality that we can fly. We can get now to the other side of the world in just hours instead of days and, you, and years, right? How convenient. And we in Christ Jesus have this, uh, what Paul describes as this law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We have the spirit of God living in us. Just get on the plane, live in the plane, let them take you up, spread your wings. Let them be like the wind that lifts you up above your struggle. Quit trying to flap your wings and do it yourself. Oh, I got this. I got this. You can't. You can't. It's impossible. There's, you don't have the ability in your flesh, in and of yourself. You can't do it. You can't fight sin in your own strength. Quit trying. You're going to wear yourself out. Rest in His grace. Amen. 
Rest in His grace. Receive His grace. Lean into His grace. Acknowledge your need for His grace. Acknowledge your sin. You know, the only kind of sin that we really are going to get freedom over is forgiven sin. Say it again. The only kind of sin we're really going to walk in freedom of having, being in bondage to is sin that's been forgiven. There's no condemnation for it. There's no penalty for it. I'm forgiven. Now walk in the freedom of that now. Live it out. Walk it out. By the grace of God. Working in you, Right? It's forgiven. It's forgotten. It's taken care of. Justice is served. The penalty is paid. And I no longer have to bear the weight of it anymore. The bondage of it anymore. And one day I'm going to be completely delivered from sin's presence. No more. No more. Amen? And so we long for that day. We look to that day. But we live in this already, not yet. Okay? The kingdom has come. Freedom has come, right? Right? But then there's still this not yet that's yet to come that we pray for, that we long for, that we look for, that we hope in Jesus is going to come back. And we're the the, the revealing of the glorious liberty of the children of God is going to be manifested before creation. Creation's going to see. Wow. These are the glorious ones. They're in Christ Jesus. We're going to get new bodies. So we also have life and peace. That should mark our lives as Christians. Not only freedom, but life and peace. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Is your life marked by life and peace? Or is it death? Is it bondage? Despair? Discouragement? Shame? Guilt? God wants to bring you into life and peace. There's a quote by Robert Murray McShane that I read this week and posted, and it ministered to my soul because I had a couple, I went through a conference, assessment conference for church planners, and so I had to do a lot of introspective stuff and just kind of examine myself and be challenged in my weaknesses as a pastor, as a husband, as a Christian. And this verse ministered to me. He says this, he says, look much on, uh, learn much of the Lord Jesus. For every look at yourself, take ten looks at Christ. He is altogether lovely, such infinite majesty, and yet such meekness and grace. And all for sinners, even the chief. Live much in the smiles of God. Bask in His beams. Feel His all-seeing eye settled on you in love and repose in His almighty. Set your mind on the things above. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. And the Spirit leads us to set our minds on Jesus. He makes much of Jesus. He glorifies Jesus. He honors Jesus. The Spirit leads us into the truth of Scripture. He brings to our remembrance the things that Jesus has said, the things that are true about God, about the gospel, about you, about me, about this broken world that we live in. The Spirit brings us into that. The Spirit leads us to set our mind on things that are pure and lovely and praiseworthy and of good report. When we're following His leading, oh, may we keep in step with the Spirit. Amen. So we have life and peace. And lastly, we have the presence and the power of the spirit as Christians. I think in some sense, we should all be charismatic at some level. What I mean by that is we have the spirit living in us. And we live and step with the spirit, acknowledging the spirit and the work of the spirit. I like to call myself a a charismatic with my seatbelt on. You know, he, he does give us self-control too, right? So we're not, it's not like we're out of control. Ah, shut up, blah, blah, blah. You know, there's self-control, right? There's good, there's fruit that should come from keeping in step with the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Kevin already read this this morning, but I'm going to read it again. <laughs> he stole my thunder. That's all right. I think we need it read over us every day. I don't think I can read these verses over you enough. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. 
if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers... We are not, we, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. We have the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit living within us. You don't have to make war on sin by yourself. You can walkie talkie and call in for help. Lord, I need some help. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I need power from you right now. I'm being tempted right now. Let me just say this too. Being free from the dominion of sin does not mean you're free from the temptations of sin in this life. I think that's helpful to hear. Being free from the dominion of sin and the bondage of sin does not mean that you're free from the temptations of sin in this life. We're going to be tempted. Jesus himself, because he became a man, was tempted, yet without sin. And he can sympathize with your weaknesses because he was tempted, yet without sin. And we can come boldly before the throne of grace to find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Lord, I need some help. Give me mercy because I blew it the way that I talked to my wife. My son. Give me grace to be like Jesus to them. Because I can't do it in my strength. I need your grace, God. So Romans 8, 13 is telling us that we are to make war on sin. Fight it. Don't surrender to it. Don't throw a white flag up to it and say, well, you, you got this one, sin. Don't let it reign in your body, in your life, by the power of the Spirit. You have the Spirit of God living inside of you. And when you do sin, you're going to quench or grieve the Holy Spirit with bitterness and words that are destructive and attitudes. We're told in Ephesians 4, don't grieve the Spirit of God who lives within you. God, the Holy Spirit, dwells within you. He's dwelling in you, and then he has power available for you. I love this about Christianity. Not only is our penalty paid for, but we have power to walk in the freedom of Jesus Christ. We have he, he who the sun sets free is free indeed. Freedom should mark our lives because of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom and we should, we should make war on sin. And so what does this look like? What does this look like to make war on sin? Just cast it out? Start praying in tongues? What, what does it look like to make war, to fight against sin? I, th- I think it looks like confessing your sin when you blow it. And if you think, if you have the misconception that as, as a Christian you can't struggle with sin or be tempted with it or, or even uh, that, that if you sin you're trapped and there's no way out, <laughs> then man, sin is going to beat you down. But the gospel tells us the penalty's paid for, there's power available. And so we can confess our sins because when we do, we're met with mercy and we're met with grace. We can come to the light and not be afraid and ashamed and be like Adam and Eve who tried to form fig leaves to cover up themselves. We can come into the light because we're going to be met and covered with grace. And so this week I got an example of how I did this, how I sinned. um, So I was tired. I stayed up. I got very little sleep Thursday night and... I wanted to do something fun with my children. It was I was do some quality time with them. And so there was this fun activity Friday night to to go do. Karate, Black Belt Academy, over with the De Los Santos, Trunk or Treat. Come on, let's have fun. Okay, let's go, guys. It's only two blocks away from here. Let's go. We can do this. So we go to this deal and 
Carson gets, he first gets dressed up in his Lego suit, you know, and then he's like, he sees people in there and he's thinking, oh, they're going to make fun of me. And he sees like, there's windows and he just sees everybody and he just, he goes and he just shuts down in fear. They're going to reject me. They're going to laugh at me, whatever, whatever he's thinking. My daughter, she goes in with me and I'm, so I'm like trying to, it's cold outside. I don't want to wait outside. So I'm kind of like, I'm tired. I just want to rest. I'd really rather be at home. I can't get my son, I can't make him go in without him, without hurting his feelings. And yeah. So what do I do? Well, I guess we'll just go home. No ice cream, no, no fun stuff. And you know what? I just, I blame Carson. My, my daughter starts to cry. Oh, we, we, let's go back. So she, she has to suffer because he can't do it as well. So I'm like, well, it's, it's Carson's fault. So I blame it on him. He's the guilty one. Right? Not being gracious. I went home and took a nap. and I woke up and I thought, oh man, I hope he's not asleep. I want to talk to him before he goes to sleep. And so I went in there, confessing, said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being impatient. And, and in a low point as a dad, having a low point in that moment, he just met me with grace and mercy. And my son was so gracious. And he said, he said, Dad, does anybody, does anybody love God more than you? My. And nod my head with tears coming out. Yes. And he said, because you really love God. And he gave me a kiss. And I just cried and hugged him. And God met me with grace, and by His Spirit, I made war on sin, and He met me with grace. And that's just a little example of how we make war on sin. We put the death, the deeds of the body, confess it, don't let it live and reign in you, and God will meet you with grace. Amen? So let's respond There's two application points, and that is don't settle for a life of bondage to sin and surrender to sin's power. Make war on sin. And know that your fight against sin is not won in your strength. It's by the grace of God. It's by the power of the Spirit. It's by the blood of Jesus Christ that we walk in victory over it. So if you need prayer this morning... And you, you want to walk in this freedom. Maybe you haven't been and you know there's more. You want to open up the altar for prayer. Or if you just want to come and kneel down before God, you can do so right there in your chair. If you want somebody to pray for you, we'd love to pray for you. You can just put your hand up and say, pray for me. So Lord, I just thank you for being able, having the gift of being able to do life with these precious brothers and sisters here at City Church. I thank you that we're a family here and that we're establishing a culture of grace, a a culture of where when we blow it, we run to the gospel and we're met with grace and mercy and love. And may we overcome the, the dominion of sin in our lives by grace humble ourselves before you and receive the grace we need. I pray that you'd give hope this morning for anybody in bondage who just feels trapped and feels despair of overcoming addiction. I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, Romans 15, 13, that you, the God of hope, would fill every person here with hope by the power of your spirit and cause um, and, and let joy and peace abound through believing.